What goes on must go off. It's the Going Off Podcast with rap critic and motherfucking muse. Darren, how you doing this week, my man? Dude, I'm <laughs> doing great, man. You know, I'm working on uh, episodes, really getting the getting the rap mm. critic machine uh, good and oiled up. You know what I'm saying? You got the station head joints that's going to be going on, you know, where you're going to hear rap critic's uh, favorite music. And you know... We're going to be playing the albums on this week's docket. One of our requests is the most farthest thing from hip hop you could possibly get in the 2000s. I don't give a fuck. (laughs) Spoiler alert. You already know what it is. You already know who it is because you saw the thumbnail. The fucking Green Day American Idiot request is, is right up there with when I think it might have been one of the first requests, if not the first one. Fucking Real Big Fish. Yeah, yeah. That was like, what the fuck? But you know what? As I always say, <laughs> that's what you get when you let the fans pick. Whoa! Oh! It's a grab bag. You never can tell. We're going to start with a familiar name. We're going to start with the Hilltop Hoods. The Hilltop Hoods. Hilltop Hoods uh, with the album The Hard Road, requested by Andrew McKay. We reviewed their 2014 album uh not too terribly long ago if you want to go back and listen to that episode all the old episodes are on soundcloud spotify and itunes yeah Um, i'm I'm gonna have to go back to that uh uh, spotify you know what i'm saying uh, going off episode you know that i can now check out on spotify you know what i'm saying i listened to our review of that album for background and contrast because i wanted to see Uh, what we had to say about that album compared to this one, because the album we're talking about this week is eight years older than the album that we talked about last time. So I kind of wanted to see where they came from, where they going. (laughs) Obviously, I want everyone to listen to the other episode, but I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it right now for you. I gave it a four and a half. Uh, you ended up giving it a fucking fiver. Wow, I put five on it. I'm just gonna say, they obviously came a long way, cause this album was not it. Oh no! Are, are, is it gonna be another week? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's gonna have to. Ah, uh, you weren't feeling it. Hey, it, it is another week, because I gave it fucking what comes around goes around. The same rating you gave fucking Arizona <gasps> Baby. <gasps> Can it be? Hmm. The tables have turned. <laughs> this this album is not a bad album. I still end up giving it a two and a half, which is, you know, it's half of five. The Overton window is on the side of good uh, for these guys. Let, let's make that clear. <laughs> a two is pretty bad news. A two and a half means that they're, hey... There was at least a little bit of enjoyment there. This album just was so painfully uninteresting to me. Oh, man, I loved uh, recapturing the vibe. Like, when I first uh, heard their first track, it was kind of like, all right, uh, you know, Australia, you know, different country. You know, they love hip hop, but maybe they're a little behind on the production side of things. You know what I'm uh, saying? Yeah, I would definitely <laughs> agree. Uh, that That's one of the main areas I think this album falls short of the 2014 one is definitely the production. Like it is lacking severely. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll agree with you on that one. Uh, One track in particular, but uh, we'll get to it. But when I found out that this album was from like, it was from like 2004, I believe. That made me lighten up on it a little. Because I was just like, okay. Because I didn't know when this came out or anything. So I thought this was this year. And I'm like, all right, the boom bap thing. Okay, guys. (laughs) You know, like we're kind of, you got to, you got to really reinvent it if you're going to do it. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing if you're going to be like, uh, your boy fucking logic right who on that fucking young sinatra album was trying to do the boom bap shit out of like out of love for it he's trying to do like an homage at least he was doing his own thing what they end up doing on this album is they're just like sampling shit from old songs and like not even like trying to create new sounds i'll say the worst it gets is clown prince like even though i like it it is kind of like the chorus is so overly sampling old school things. 
Yeah. I liked the beats and samples on that one, but it was a bit much. This is how I'm going to try to draw the parallel here. You know how in the 80s there was that thing of, like, British artists really loved, like, black artists from the 50s from America? Oh, I f- yeah. I feel like it's, like, a similar thing where it's just like, yo, man, we're just getting into this. We're just learning about this thing. It's like, and we really love it, and we're, like, really appreciating it and maybe overly homaging to it as a result. That's very possible. It feels like that anyway, yeah. Whereas I felt that way at first, I actually feel like they got to find their voice as, as the album goes on. I feel like there's a unique usage of i don't know what that necessarily uh what that flute is called but it's like the australian flute you, you know what that flute is you've heard it in uh the land down under you know what i mean the boo, 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 boo. is it just a flute or is it something specific to australia oh at first i was gonna say you're talking about a fucking didgeridoo but no 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 um, no, no yeah i'm not exactly sure what that is yeah it is it is just kind of sound like a standard issue flute though yeah but like as i was listening to the album i was like oh hey they're using that a lot it's like i, I wonder if that's kind of like their way of like yo but this is our version of hip-hop now you know mm. what i mean I appreciated little fun things like that. And then lyrically, I thought, dude was nice, man. Uh, fucking recapturing the vibe. That one lyric where he says, uh, you hear this bumping in your clubs, you turn your car around, you hear it pumping in the pub, you buy the bar around. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I thought everything, lyrics included, were solidly average. I wasn't blown away by too much of anything, honestly. Oh, man. Like, I'm trying to look through here. Uh, there was one line... Uh, in Clown Prince, I have highlighted that that made me smile. My foot's always in my mouth. I just can't stomach defeat. <laughs> oh, okay, that one was kind of... <laughs> Even the good lines are kind of corny, in my opinion, but they're still all right. I'm just going to go down to the song I thought was the worst. That would be Conversations from a Speakeasy. I thought it was just kind of like a chill-ass track. I love the little piano, you know, in the background with the little... Because it was like they were kind of going for the 1920s, but with hip hop. And it's kind of like, yeah, we're just chilling. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what was that one lyric? He says, uh, I last forever like a bad impression. <laughs> like the first night you curse with adolescence. It was just kind of like, I don't know. I thought they had little flips of wordplay that was just kind of like, huh, I wouldn't have thought of that. Okay. If you've got piano going in there and you're doing a 20s thing and you're calling it conversations from a speakeasy, why is it not? conversations from a speakeasy you're right they they did drop the ball on the opportunity to really make that pop you're right and i get it you're australian so maybe they're not in the know then don't do it if you don't know don't do it but the thing that got me so uh this drove me crazy where they're talking about how fucking dope they are and they're not saying like anything remotely interesting this fucking one line in the um in the guest verse uh from omni where he says But that's what happens when you do something different. Some people just stay content with the same old shit. What the fuck do you call this? (laughs) You're not fucking breaking any new ground here. Like, but they're making it sound like they're so fucking fresh. You're okay at best. Yeah, exactly. But that's part of the, you can't be open mic eagle. You can't have the qualifiers, you know. We're the best, you know, mostly. Like, I mean... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, we don't want to, you know, overspeak ourselves. But, you know, the funny thing is, it's just like, I mean, but are you, though? <laughs> you know? Like, I know you have to say you're the best, but are you, though? <laughs> I was going to say, it's a fucking hip-hop staple of bragging and saying you're the best. But do you have to? Do you have to? <laughs> it's like, you know what it is? I can hear a Black Eyed Peas track where they're having fun. But the minute you get to the Boom Boom Pals where you're telling me you're the dopest beat makers, you're the dopest rhyme sayers. <laughs> are you really though did you hear your own punchlines? <laughs> what did you think of um stopping all stations that was the one where it starts off about the dude who's the bus driver and he gets jacked and then the second verse is about like the woman who's like you know working a job as a stripper who ends up helping that guy and then the third verse is about the guy who robs the old man i thought it was an interesting sort of like um you know a sort of what's the word uh nolan-esque way of telling a story right i thought it was an uninteresting story personally but i thought it was told well so basically uh, memento no i'm playing <laughs> oh shit no 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 Shots no, no, no. Fired. Wait, wait, wait 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 let me be clear let me be clear the reason why i say that film buffs film buffs the reason why i say that is because it don't isn't the uh, common consensus that like if the movie was told in like the original order it's not as interesting as a story the point oh my is, god yes you know what i'm saying yeah yeah like that's what people say i'm trying to think here of songs that kind of bowled me over because most of them honestly honestly didn't a lot of them are middle of the road for me um 
I thought Blue Blooded was one of the better ones. Yes, the crew cut where that synth just felt like it was just like was just slightly louder than it should have been. I thought the beat on that one was a cut above the rest, and I like the inclusion of the other folks on the album. With that said, I thought all the non Hilltop Hood members fucking killed it and kind of outclassed uh, the actual members of the group. Like, if they weren't on it, I probably would have liked the song even more. Man. And it's not to say they're bad, but it's like, it's yeah, just, you just so weren't, You weren't feeling their, uh, their styles. City of Lights. City of Lights had uh, one, one joint where he said, uh, Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, okay. Okay. He said, uh, You see, mate, I refuse to lay low and gave those better years of my life to pave roads. Uh, live as hell. We did it by ourselves. The only secret to the shit is one that time will tell. I was like, Ooh, okay. Okay. I like City of Light. I thought that was very interesting storytelling. It did a really good job of like painting a picture with words i liked that one same goes for circuit breaker i thought the beat was dope on that one but i gotta oh. point this out because it fucking drove me crazy <laughs> what what i warn you kid your bitch made like puppies switchblade to nazis cut them through their khakis i lose it every time i put it down like car keys and and i'm sitting there like <laughs> all right that's pretty dope and then immediately you hear the guy go I put it down like car keys. That was pretty good, huh? It was was like, oh my... And then he goes, I'm the greatest, and you hate it. I'm the great... Fuck off. You had a good thing. You know? Why'd you have to ruin it? Honestly, see, I think maybe that... This is the uh, lightning rod moment that'll tell you whether or not you're going to enjoy this album. Because... And it's like, they they don't do that shit. Often. Why are you doing ad-libbing now? I didn't think you were those guys. What the fuck is this? To me, as it happened, it was just so over the top up its ass with how congratulatory it was. It just felt like, all right. <laughs> like, because it was him complimenting himself, complimenting himself. He was like, yeah, that was really clever. Oh, man, losing every time. Yeah, that's a really good line. Yeah, like, oh, man. Yo, I really am a fucking great. Like, it was just so up its own ass. It's just like, I can't believe that he actually is like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that probably is one of the best parts on the album so i would get excited but if you were doing that shit like throughout the album and established yourselves as like the we don't take ourselves too seriously and we, and we like to have fun every once in a while but because it was just on one track it fucking took me off guard i'll put it to you like this like if lil wayne did this line what he would do is the annoying you know laugh after you know what i mean i'll put it down like coggies <laughs> I did it to daddy, and maybe he'll even repeat the line. I told the motherfucking put it down like, and if you think I'm fucking joking, listen to Mrs. Officer. Uh, what, what did he say? Uh, beat it like a cop. Now one baby said, beat it like a cop. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> beat it like a cop, because he says it like two other times, and it's just like that. That wasn't funny the first time, but I like with this, it's like it's the understanding of like, no, I know I'm being an asshole, but like that's what I thought was funny about it. Like the the melodramaticness of the pomposity of the other big word of the silliness of it, basically. Leave him dead in the living room. Get it? Leave him dead in the living room. Out of all the people repeating their own lines and being satisfied with their own fart of a lyric, you know what I mean? I, 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 this is the most enjoyable to me. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, but oh, oh, there was one track in particular that I felt was a dope, like a nice party track. Like I could feel where it was going, but the production just felt, I don't know how to describe it other than like loose. It just felt like it didn't fit. It needed to either be slower or it just needed more oomph to it or just just something was wrong. Do you remember what track I'm talking about? It was like a real like it was like a rock track. You know what I mean? Uh, it might be What a Great Night. Maybe that one or or Breathe. Yes, it was What a Great Night because that one had a music video for it. That was kind of funny. And I'm like and as you watched it, you know, I kind of I, I kind of put it in perspective, right? Like, OK, it's not the best production. And then I was like. All right, but this music video kind of looks like it's not the highest production either. And you can kind of get this sense of like, these are more underground guys. And it's kind of like cool that they were able to put this together. You know what I mean? Like in the first place, you know, and they had like a cool idea of like the way the camera was moving in relation to like people drinking. You know what I mean? And that was kind of it was kind of like doing a cool idea with what you got. And it, and so in that level, it's like okay, I can I, I, I'm cool with the fact that maybe it's like the production's not the best, but at the same time, like I cannot help but feel if just like somebody just like oh, if you just got fucking Timbaland or somebody just like 
kick this up real quick. This would have been like, you know what I mean? I would have totally been wanting to play this for everybody, you know? Another idea that I thought was interesting, but they didn't do enough with it, Audience with the Devil. Yeah, I, I did feel like that one didn't go far enough. You're right. I'm going to ruin the song and waste a lot of time with these pointless interludes of like a sample from a movie that is just like, I just skip over it. It's like, I don't care. Dude. I didn't think the sample was too bad. I felt like it was awkwardly used. Like I just thought it took up too much time. I think they went to the well too many times. Part of that issue was like it would reuse part of the dialogue that it already said before. Mm. And it was just like, I already heard that part. Get yeah, to the stop. point. You know, it, it was just awkwardly put together. And in a way that's just like, man, you know what I mean? I'm not a fan of the pitch shifted hooks on you're right I, I didn't like that yeah on recapturing the vibe mm. the, do you feel the vibe i hated that yeah so i didn't annoying. like that you're right. that yeah I, I was like i was trying to give that a chance but i was just like nah, I'm not they do it, it way too fucking much yeah. for me to give it a pass right? okay if it had happened like the one time and then it's like every other time it had happened maybe that would have been yeah 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 and then they did that on the hard road they uh pitch shifted a sampled chorus uh, for that song, so it's like great. N n now your whole chorus is a pitch shifted sample. You know what this and it's is? Like mm. this was the Kanye production era when everyone was fucking, uh, uh, you know, pitch shifting their shit. Remember? Everyone <laughs> was. Yeah, this is very of its time. This but is like the album of the Chipmunks era. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> The Hard Road, especially for a title track, I thought it was an odd pick because it's far from the uh, strongest track. It had some clever bars. Uh, but then it also has some real groaners. Like, I liked the line, uh, we're going nowhere like a child's letters to God. I thought that was fun. It's <laughs> like, man, you had to bring the kids into it, man. <laughs> but, but then he fucking says, which is ironic because he actually does, like, finish a fucking verse with this. Finish with a bang like Kurt Cobain's discography. Can we, can we just stop? It's time to stop. I know it was 2006. Retroactively, it's time to stop. But yeah, overall, I would say the perfect words to describe this are solidly average. Uh, for me, it was very middle of the road, unimpressive. But obviously, they went places because I liked that follow up way more. Uh, so check out the later albums is my recommendation. I felt like they're solid enough. They definitely get better. Uh, but you know, um, if, if you can forgive a bit of the production and, and some of the, the silliness and sloppiness, I think it's a solid enough joint. I, I gave it about a four. We're bringing you American Idiot by Green Day, uh, appropriately requested on Darren's Patreon. <laughs> mm, uh, thank you, Elijah Stoyer. No, I mean it though. I actually do mean it though, because... I did not realize how big of a fan of Green Day I was till I till I decided to go back because I was like, wait, this song's on this album too, and this song, and this song, and and that was before we got to like my fucking favorite rock track off of the fucking Tony Hawk American Wasteland goddamn soundtrack. Yo, anybody remember that shit? Uh, yo, like straight up and down. I my fucking listening experience. <laughs> Like, literally just going like, wait, what other songs do I like by Green Day? It was that one? And that, yo, am I a fucking Green Day fan? I didn't even goddamn know it. <laughs> like, I just thought I knew a couple of their songs, but I was like, wait, that one too? <laughs> it's an odd album in a lot of regards, but especially in the discography of uh, Green Day, because it, it's kind of... Yeah, that's what I heard. It's kind of divisive. I remember at the time, we're talking all the way back in, what, 2003, 2004, when this mm. came out. I was still in high school. It was during the fucking Bush administration. And when you're living in the South, when mm. you're living in the South. And, <laughs> Need you say more. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the attitude on this album where it's like, you know, I'm not a part of a redneck agenda. It's very thumbing your nose up at oh, the yeah. fucking pro-war, pro-Bush surroundings. And I definitely uh, related to to that because especially after 9-11 we had in our high school on fridays while you were leaving they would play music over oh, the speakers what music would they play <laughs> it was you know it was like pop music of the day you know it oh, was okay. all right oh, okay. it was pretty cool after 9-11 it was goddamn lee greenwood God proud damn. to be an american <laughs> Oh, it, it was a Raise Up remix. Uh, uh, the All Seas remix. Yeah. We could only be so lucky for some Petey fucking Pablo. <laughs> nah, um, I just remember at the time just being like, 
patriotism, even down here, I didn't think patriotism was that big until 9-11. And you saw fucking American flags every goddamn where. Oh, I and remember. as a kid, I thought it was the most phony fucking, like, the, see, it was that's reactionary. The thing. Yeah, that's the thing. It didn't feel like it was actual pride. It felt like, okay, guys, see, we're not scared. We're not scared. See, look out for You yeah. know what I mean? And it's like, I get it. I get where you're coming from. But with that came... A lot of Islamophobia, a yeah. lot of racism targeted towards anyone from the fucking Middle East. You know, your boy rap critic did a little research, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I didn't want to be caught slipping. You know, th- this is no bullshit fucking Radiohead album. This is goddamn Green Day, okay? No, I'm, I'm playing. <laughs> no, 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 but for real. Shots right. fired! No, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. I, I'm just fucking with you. Um... No, but especially hearing the the first track when he gets to that one part where he says, Well, maybe I'm the faggot America. That was the lyric where I stopped and I had to go, this track one, you know. Can he like, say that? <laughs> I, 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 I stopped. Like, I'm like, okay. Let me, let me look this up. All right. Let me, <laughs> before I even come up with any reaction, let me just see what they're saying about the lyric on the G. Let me see what they say, you know. And I, the first thing I looked up is that um I found that he's bisexual. And so I was like, oh. Uh, okay 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 all right all right now let me see what you say or let me let me look at the context let me look at the context and as i was looking it up the, his specific inspiration was hearing a uh who, who what's what song was it it was leonard skinner uh that that's how i like it just fucking the most He's like proud to be a redneck type song and he was like why would anyone be why would anyone be proud to be like that and that was all he needed it was just like, you know what? <laughs> Fucking going in hot. And, and going in hot is a way I would describe a lot of these songs. Like the first 10 seconds immediately gives you the the pace and emotion that it's going with. And I noticed that specifically in certain lyrics. Um, I mean, of course, we have American Idiot. Don't want to be an American. Like, boom, that's the lyric. You know, this is the emotion. This is the, exactly. What's, what's the one where he says he's coming down? St. Jimmy, when the beat switches up in the middle and he says, St. Jimmy's coming down the alleyway up on the boulevard like a zip gone on parade. And with the beat switch, like, you felt the energy of those lyrics. And it was just like, what the fuck is a zip gun? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, of course, you look it up and it's just like, oh, my God. And you're just like, yo, this motherfucker really knows how to write a goddamn song. I bought it first week. I was working in Circuit City. I knew we got the album in because I stocked it on the fucking shelf. And I was like, I need this. I really liked Green Day. I liked their older albums. But I was more partial to Dookie and Insomniac. And then after that, you got Nimrod and Warning. And I didn't really listen to them that much, but they were more on the poppy side. So when American Idiot dropped, it was kind of a throwback. So this was their mama said knock you out is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was a bit more punk than the last couple albums, so people were glad to hear that. But for me, it wasn't punk enough, and I kind of wrote the album off Uh at the time. At the time, I was like, eh, this ain't it. And I was on that side where people were like, this album's garbage. I like the hits and whatever, but I kind of just wrote it off. And this is, no joke, the first time I listened to this album in over a decade. Any impressions I had about the album up until this point, I pretty much forgot them. So it was almost like I was going into this for the first time, like like you were. Uh. Except for the few songs that you were familiar with, like American Idiot, obviously, yeah, Holiday, uh, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, Fucking Wake Me Up When September Ends. Oh my god. That that was the one that got me into it. I remember, I remember coming home one day. I, like, I remember the day coming home and listening and hearing that song for the first time. You know what I mean? You know when you remember a song you hear for the first time? Because I remember it was on my old fucking, uh, you know, my fucking boombox where I thought it was fucking cool because like, look, I can listen to music whenever I want to, you know, back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's in my room, mom, you know. Uh, Wake Me Up When September Ends was the song where I was like, I'm not here for this. I'm here oh! for Oh, punk no! Shit. You were being a con- the, the contrarian. <laughs> I oh, dude! In high school, me, holy fucking shit, dude! <laughs> that guy was a prick. So yeah, um, see, so, yeah, I just kind of was like, eh, whatever. I'm here for the fucking punk shit because I'm a fucking purist and a fucking gatekeeper <laughs> and a little dick. But coming back to it after all this time, I still gotta say though, the strongest points on the album, I think, are still. American Idiot, Holiday, Slash, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. They could have easily separated them into two separate tracks, but they didn't. I don't fucking know why they did that. I didn't see the importance of that. I mean, I get it. They flow into each other, but you still don't. 
have to do that. Uh, Wake Me Up When September Ends, I think those are the strongest cuts. Beautiful song. As an album and as a concept album that's supposed to have a flowing narrative, I I don't, I don't, think. I don't know where that narrative thing came from. <laughs> not the strongest story, not the strongest characters. They made it into a musical, and I assume the story has more depth there than it does on the album because, man, there's barely a story here. But some of the songs in the middle uh, that are supposed to be kind of furthering that story feel so filler to me. Like, uh, songs in particular, Extraordinary Girl, uh, She's a Rebel, I was kind of, eh. Yeah, you were absolutely right. I was thinking, like, I remember, um, by the time I got to track St. Jimmy, after that one, I'm like, yo, man, this was a classic, like, four tracks ago, y'all could just end it now. In a nutshell, the fucking Too Long Didn't Read Footnotes, Cliff Notes version here is, you got this character who's literally named Jesus of Suburbia. It's a bit on the nose. (laughs) So just trust me here when I tell you that this is what the story is supposed to be. Oh, okay. Because honestly, if you were listening to this album face value, you're probably not going to get all this detail. You got to watch the fucking supplemental shit. Like that 11-minute music video that I tried to Uh, watch. How am I supposed to like Jesus of Suburbia, by the way? When in the first minute of this fucking 11 minute epic, where originally I looked it up on YouTube and I saw it was like nine minutes in parentheses, it said short version. Right. I was like, (laughs) I'm sorry. The short version is just missing a minute and a half of dialogue. uh, And even some of that is worked into the shorter version. So you kind of get it. But not really. Jesus of Suburbia is an unlikable, arrogant... Absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's a whole like... portion in the middle where it just looks like the director just said, hey, just go to a 7-Eleven and just act like a douchebag. <laughs> just throw Funyuns everywhere. My, my <laughs> God, dude. Funyuns? You could not have picked a shitty snack to throw. You had to pick the best fucking snack in the whole goddamn convenience store to waste. You're a prick. If you didn't already say, I only like you for your tits, before in the beginning of the video, this is the turning point. This is what they call in wrestling, the heel turn. When I see you throwing Funyuns around. That was was the throwing down of the gauntlet. I'm done! (laughs) You've gone too far. (laughs) But no, um, so this guy, he's in the post-9-11 George Bush world. He sees all the news on TV and all the pro-war shit. And he feels like he's the martyr that is just taking on all the fucking problems of suburbia, man. And the first question becomes, how? (laughs) (laughs) And, dude, I get it. Because, honestly, if you're hearing this for the first time and you're in your mid-teens, you're fucking high school, you you fucking relate. Because you think like that. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to that in a second. But, yeah, go on. Then we're randomly introduced to... The alter ego of Jesus of Suburbia, the Tyler Durden. Oh, there's an alter ego. That's not the alter ego? No, the the Tyler Durden, so to speak, of Jesus of Suburbia is St. Jimmy, who is supposed to be the opposite side of the same coin, but is exactly like the first side of the coin. What the hell are you talking? What? At what point did that happen? See, exactly. Where where was this indicated? (laughs) You gotta read along, dude! <laughs> if, Don't you? You gotta read along with the Childish Gambino booklet yeah, <laughs> that mm-hmm. came along with the album. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jimmy slash Jesus uh, meets, <laughs> meets a girl who, I'm just gonna go ahead and say here, the most creatively named What's Her Name. And, uh, and they start a little fling. Jesus finds that, hey... This girl I just met, you know, maybe she's the replacement for that Novocaine I needed in the last track. Maybe she's the medicine ooh, I ooh. need. Oh, bit of story going on a here. A little bit. bit character development. A little bit. We find out one track, okay, she's a rebel, cool. In the next track, we find out she's extraordinary. All right. Not a lot of detail, but sure. But then, by the very next track, she's fucking had it with this goddamn... Cry baby, martyr ass, oh woe is me, and she's fucking gone. She's Splitsville. Then 
We go to Wake Me Up When September Ends, which wasn't supposed to be on the album. It was actually supposed to be on an album before this, but it's because the song is about Billy Joe's father he lost back in like the early 90s. And he said that he wasn't emotionally ready to record the song when he was originally going to. So it found its way onto this album just by chance. Homecoming is a mess. Um, it's supposed to tell you a few different things. It's supposed to chronicle his return home, killing off his alter ego, getting a routine job, just kind of still longing for his lost love in uh, What's-Her-Name. This is the thing that gets you, the listener, to, to get up out of your seat and live your dreams, you know? Don't be stuck at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> Throwing Funyuns everywhere. <laughs> The most up your ass you can get is calling yourself fucking the savior and literally not be doing anything. I don't know what's worse. Jesus throwing a bunch of Funyuns around in the store itself or St. Jimmy cutting his hand open in a freshly painted bathroom, smearing his blood on the fucking wall and writing St. Jimmy on the wall. See, even in both instances, he's either a savior or a saint. It feels like a smarter writer would realize that this isn't the guy you'd want to be, so there would be some sort of commentary, a meta-commentary, about a character who believes he's fucking jesus but isn't doing anything but then it never comes all the way back around it genuinely wants you to believe that woe is this fucking guy who you know sees the real issues and the real issues are again like you have this awesome thesis statement of american idiots saying like i don't want to be that mindless thing that's just following along with this you know fake religion and fake reality of what i consider to be this suburban uh area but then he not only doesn't have any answers himself, he doesn't really sound like he's looking for any. And so it's just like, well, okay, you're angry about it, but what are your ideas? What are your thoughts? It's angry, but it doesn't have any direction. In one instance, I can see it relating to youth in a very visceral way, right? The idea of like, Yo, America's telling me, or, or whatever country I'm a part of, or whatever institution I'm a part of, is telling me that things are this way, but, you know, I don't see why it has to be that way, so fuck you guys. I feel like I'm trying to go along with his emotion, but I'm not seeing where it lands, and uh, uh, one in particular, the lyric where he says, um, he says, at the center of the earth in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven was where I was taught the motto is just a lie. It says home is where your heart is, but what a sham, because everyone's heart doesn't beat the same. It's beating out of time. Now, that's a lyric that I thought was dope, right? Like, it, it in a way can speak to a general sense of, like, I feel like either I don't belong here or something is wrong with where I am. You know what I'm saying? There is some sort of uncomfortableness with the reality within which I, I live. And I think the kids in general may be getting that sense. I don't want to say no culture, but just like no sense of purpose. Then, you know, you'll have a lyric where it says, I read the graffiti in the bathroom stall like the holy scriptures of the shopping mall. And so it seemed to confess. It didn't say much, but it only confirmed that the center of the earth is the center of the world. And I could really care less. I think a big part of Jesus's backstory is that he comes from a broken home. That's where I feel like a song like Wake Me Up When September Rins does sort of like give you, it's a puzzle piece, right? You know, it's not telling you everything, but it is telling you that like there is a someone who is missing right now and I'm trying to ignore this pain. But it just doesn't feel like he's along enough in his journey where he can really illustrate what that is. We got to talk about Jesus of Suburbia a little bit because this is a nine minute Woo. track that is uh i love it though i, I ain't gonna lie <laughs> it's broken up in either four or five segments which for albums we've talked about on the podcast before especially you'll get a long song here and there that's broken up into parts right but uh -huh. it's important to note that this is a punk album and punk songs are typically two three minutes that's a good point yeah so nine minutes for a punk song is not not to say it's never been done up until this point yeah but as far as a mainstream punk group it was kind of it was kind of different it was daring it was it was kind of ballsy um to take a chance and say like no we're just gonna have the song it's gonna cover all of these different things it's gonna switch up every like two three minutes 
into into these pretty much their own like self-contained yeah yeah that's what i was like so it's like you know it's a nine minute song but it was like oh wait these are just four different songs i think it personally goes on too long um especially because towards the end it kind of loses its impact and it doesn't really say a whole lot you almost kind of get the bookends of jesus of suburbia and homecoming because homecoming tries it too where it's in a bunch of different parts the members of the group wrote their own portions of the song. You can tell, uh, because Billy Joe's parts are way better. Because you got this one part. <laughs> I was kinda okay. I wanna say Mike Dirt wrote this portion of the song, which the guy from back home who started his own band, and man, he's just having such a great time. He's just rocking out, and it sounds like almost like something out of Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's but what done I was about poorly. to fucking say. Is I got a rock and roll band. <laughs> oh, it's so cringy, dude. If that's the point, then you did it really fucking well because that that whole section gotta go. I got a rock and roll band. I got a rock and roll girlfriend. I got a rock and roll house. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a rock and roll house. It's just it's just jumping left and right all the time. There's fucking Beatles and uh, uh, Beatles and Rolling Stones memorabilia everywhere. Oh my god, just falling off the walls because they're rocking so hard, man. Like the, those, uh, it's the uh, rock equivalent of those uh, um, 20s cartoons, you know, where everyone was fucking bouncing all the goddamn time. Oh yeah, the fucking house is swaying side to side. The house has a face. That's legit what that song sounded like. <laughs> Some of the better songs that weren't hits, I thought St. Jimmy was... It didn't sound like old Green Day, but it sounded like just a classic punk tune. Specifically, the fucking one, two, three, four count off was like, ooh... Mmm, mm, fucking Ramones vibes just washed over, and I was like, mmm, and that song was super fucking catchy. Uh, the lyrics were a bit corny, but then again, if it's supposed to be St. Jimmy's, like, character, he was like, what the fuck does he say, like? It's comedy and tragedy, it's St. Jimmy, and that's my name, and don't wear it out. <laughs> Oh, At that man. point, I was like, St. Jimmy fucking sucks. Right. <laughs> As a guy, he sucks. As a song, this was all right. There does seem to be a sense of just like, even just like watching the music videos, watching these guys, it's like, there's a sense of, I see in you, there's that like, you know, I really want to make a big statement, and there's a couple of songs, there's a really big statement, but... I didn't really know where I was going with this, but, you know, I, maybe if I just tough it out, you know, and keep wearing the black mascara and, yeah, you know, like, I can <laughs> I could rock through it, you know? Letterbomb was one I thought was pretty good. And it says, uh, Letterbomb seems to be presented from the perspective of what's-her-name. And they they really gave her that? Really? Okay, all right. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's its own for, sort of fucking uh, dissertation. Anyway. Uh, this is apparent in the Broadway adaptation as well as in the middle eight of the song. And in which they're quoting the lyric from the, I'm assuming the musical, where she says, You're not the Jesus of suburbia. In all, I'm pretty sure that song is just, that's the fucking Dear John letter. I really wish we learned more about Jesus in these fucking songs because you don't get, a, you don't get enough background to care about the heartbreak that comes later. Because it's like, well, you're a dick. She was in a really shitty relationship with a really shitty dude. Why would I want you two together? I feel like the music videos heightened, in a, in a sense, uh, the importance of some of these songs, right? They put so much war imagery in it purely because, you know, it's the nature of the time, right? And, like, they play up certain aspects, but then when you get into the actual, like, meat of the album, it's not there. But if you look in the music videos, they put all, they pump it with all this story of, like, you know, these people love each other, but he's going off to war because he thinks that's going to be, you know, best for them. Because, you know, he doesn't have any opportunity here, so the only thing, you know, he could find value in is giving his, you know, selling his body to, to, to his country. You know, if you look at it in that sort of, like, way that it feels like the director of the music video is trying to give us, right? But then, you know, 
that story is nowhere on this album. They were trying to make up for it so fucking hard. Exactly. By making and, and up it, something that just wasn't there. And it felt insulting at points where it was just like, but that's not what happened on the album. So why are you acting like, you know, if it's just one music video, fine. But it was like over several. It's just like, why are you acting like this? is? So, you know what I mean? Now, going from that huge point to just a small fucking point, uh, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. I know this is just the stupidest thing, but I just always want to point out, like, in the music video, he's saying, I walk alone, I walk alone, I walk alone. And I'm just like, the... The other guys are like right there. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like. Well, like, no, I mean, I, I mean, like we, but. Mm. <laughs> well, it's like a wolf pack of lone wolves. <laughs> a pet peeve I have uh, is in the song Holiday. I will say it's in one of the fucking. It's so fucking dope. The goddamn bridge of holiday. Yes. The uh, the representative from California has the floor. Goddamn. That fucking part is so goddamn cool. <laughs> but fucking Sig Heil to the president, gas man, bombs away as your punishment, pulverize the Eiffel Tower, who criticized your government. Because, yeah, because at the time, France yes. was very... So, again, you might have to get a little background, a little history lesson. Mm -hmm. Weren't expecting that from fucking punk album. But here you go. It's not the F word, because it's Billy. I get it. He can say it. It's the end. Just cause, just cause, one more time, just because we are the outlaws, yeah, because we didn't write enough to fill this bar, so I'm just yelling yeah at the end of it. Come on, man, you had such a fucking cool thing going there, and it feels like he just pissed it down his leg at the very end, he just gave up. Anytime he says the word me. <laughs> meh. <laughs> meh. <laughs> fucking meh. Oh my god. I love Billy's meh. <laughs> it, Billy, uh, it's um, Green Day and fucking InSync. <laughs> oh yeah. That is the white pop star accent. Meh. <laughs> it's gonna be meh. It's that California accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, what it is. Blink-182 have the song uh, Miss You, which I'm sure you've had or heard. Oh, but oh one of my favorites. There's there's a video of them in the studio writing it, mm -hmm. and one of the dudes, he's, he's writing it, and he's just reading it along, and goes, don't waste your time on me, I'm already the voice inside your head. And he just says that. And then and he, he repeats it a few times, and then the other guy's like, oh, okay, I think I got it. Don't waste your time on me. I'm already the voice inside <laughs> my head. <laughs> and the other guy just said, uh, you're already the voice inside my head. Vo inside yeah. my head. No, I totally got it. My head. <laughs> Dude, it's, you got to watch the video because they, they repeat it back to each other. My head. My head. Oh, inside my God. My head. Where, <laughs> where's this video? Voice inside my head. Voice inside my head. Samuel, you're already the voice no, inside the voice my inside head. My but, it, but I have to go up from already, right? Don't oh, waste your time on me. You're already the yeah, so voice. The voice inside my head. The voice in the boy. Wait. The boy. The voice. The voice inside my head. The voice inside <laughs> The voice. But yeah, uh, uh, so what would you give it overall? Overall, I got a three and a half. Oh man, uh, I'd give it a four. Uh, the songs that really weighed it down for me were uh, Extraordinary Girl, the unnecessary what's-her-name, because it feels like it's redundant after Homecoming, and it doesn't add anything to the story. I like that song, but you're right, it does feel like it doesn't... It, it, by this point, it feels like we've already heard enough songs about this girl. You know what I mean? And I just don't care about their relationship. Yeah, anyway. like you did not give me a reason to care. And there was one song in particular that I uh, that I had written down. Uh, give me Novocaine for how his lyrics work in tandem with the music to really uh, you know give you a message at certain points. I don't know. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, one lyric where he says, uh, drain this pressure from the sweat. And then, like, right as he says, you hear the, -na 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 -na. the sensations overwhelm. -na 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 -na. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It felt like there was a little bit of like, oh, OK, you're really trying to say something with how the music is working versus what the words are saying, you know? That about does it for this week's episode. We said we were going to get back to the Patreon requests and your boys don't lie. Mm. It took a little bit, but we're back at it. Back at it again, back on our bullshit with the two Patreon requested albums. And if you have an album that you would like to hear us talk about, obviously genre's no issue. Head on over to either of our Patreons. It's patreon.com slash rapcritic or patreon.com slash muse mm. uh, for details. Read up, see how you can request an album to be reviewed on the show. 
You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, as previously mentioned, we got all the old episodes on SoundCloud, iTunes, and now, now on most Spotify. importantly, mm-hmm. fucking Spotify. It's easier than ever. And uh, just to throw it out there, you know, I'm working with uh, this new app called Brew, you know, a new podcast app called Brew. Uh, so we got a little new podcast review, a new where I'm reviewing uh, where, where I'm reviewing movies with a friend of mine, uh, starting with Kevin Smith's movies. So, you know, go check that out. Go cop that, you know, get with it. Act like you want it. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to say, keep your eyes open. Oh, and your ears as well. For the Going Off podcast, I'm Muse. And I'm Rap Critic. And Cardi B's outfit at the gala looked like a freeze frame of when the elevator doors opened up in The Shining, but, you know, it still looked cool as hell. So, you know, props for that shit. <laughs>